Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, the microRNA regulatory landscape of MSC-derived exosomes, a system view, presented by Julianne Nguyen, Assistant Professor, Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, University of Buffalo. I'm Alexis Corrales of Labyrinth, and I'll be our moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labyrinth and sponsored by NanoString Technologies. For more information about our sponsor, please visit www.nanostring.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nguyen. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Alexis, for the introduction. Thank you for having me here today. So I'm going to talk about our work on exosome characterization and exosomes as drug carriers. In the last few years, there has been great interest in exosomes and the role in intercellular communication. Exosomes exert specific effects on the microenvironment and in doing so play important roles in intercellular communication in both healthy and diseased tissues. So in this image, you can see how exosomes are secreted by donor cells and are then taken up by the recipient cells. And so exosomes are able to functionally transfer microRNAs, non-coding RNAs, proteins, but also lipids into the recipient cells, and in doing so, exert specific biological effects on the recipient cells. Many groups have started to use exosomes as delivery vehicles for different types of cargos, as you can see here on this table. This one specifically focuses on the delivery of RNA, um, pre-microRNA, and siRNA. The applications range from neurological diseases to cancer and tissue regeneration, including ischemic heart diseases and brain diseases. And what you can also see from this table is that different types of cells are used as donors for exosomes. Popular cells are human embryonic kidney cells, here abbreviated as HAC293T cells, mesenchymal stem cells, but also cancer cells. So, yeah, so despite the tremendous progress and the great interest in exosome-based therapeutics, there are still challenges associated with using exosomes as drug carriers. So as you can see here, exosomes contain a lot of different components, um, mRNA, non-coding RNA, they can contain proteins in the lipid membrane, and they can also contain proteins in the hydrophilic core of the exosomes, and they consist of a lipid bilayer. So with so many components, it's really important to ask what is the function of all these components and how do they affect the intrinsic biological effects of the exosomes. And this is important for two reasons. The first reason is can we capitalize on the intrinsic biological effects of exosomes as drug carriers? And the second question is, um, how do these different components affect the side effects of exosomes when used as drug carriers? And so one of the exosomes we are interested in were exosomes derived from mesenchymal stem cells. So mesen Chymo stem cell exosomes are of interest because of their ability to regenerate tissues after myocardial infarction, but also after infarcts of the brain and their ability to promote wound healing. Over the last few years, researchers have discovered 
that part of the regenerative effects of MSCs is mediated by exosomes. And this was a very important finding as it would open up new avenues for cell-free therapies. And while the regenerative effects of MSC exosomes have been studied, it's not fully really understood what components of the exosome mediate those effects. And so we and others have shown that MSC exosomes are able to mediate angiogenic effects in a dose-dependent manner. So with increasing concentrations of exosomes, as you can see here on the right-hand side, um, we can increase the total length of tube segments. This is also visible in the images on the right-hand side where MSC exosomes visibly promote the formation of branching in Huvex. And this is shown in the bottom image of the 7.5 microgram per milliliter exosome. And so while angiogenic effects were reported for individual microRNAs, the mechanism vary, and it's still unclear which specific genes are targeted by the exosomal MSC exosome. And in order to examine the mechanism of MSC exosomes in promoting angiogenesis, we performed RNA sequencing on Huvex treated with MSC exosomes. And so the heat map on the left shows upregulated and downregulated genes when Huvex were treated with MSC exosomes. The graph on the right illustrates the fold enrichment of pro-angiogenic and anti-angiogenic genes in Huvex treated with MSC exosomes compared to non-treated control cells. So the mRNA sequencing analysis revealed that a number of genes promoting angiogenesis were upregulated compared to non-treated cells, and some genes were not detected in any control samples that were detected in the MSC exosome-treated samples. And these include numerous angiopoietin genes, such as ANCPT1, ANCPT4, and ANCPTL4, as well as other important mediators of angiogenesis, such as ethylene type B receptor 2 and neuropolin 2. Additional um, several genes that are known to inhibit angiogenesis were downregulated in Huvex treated with MSC exosomes. And so the, those are shown in red. Um, among those genes were ALOX5 and protein phosphatase 1A that were significantly downregulated, and those were reported as negative regulators of angiogenesis. MSC exosomes also have antifibrotic effects. And so what we did here is we stimulated cardiac fibroblasts with TGF-beta to stimulate collagen expression. And we then incubated the cells with increasing concentrations of exosomes. The concentrations we used range from 0.1 to 8 microgram per milliliter. And as you can see, with increasing concentrations of exosomes, we were actually able to reverse the collagen production in cardiac fibroblasts. And so this is consistent with reports showing that MSC exosomes have antifibrotic effects when administered in animal models with induced myocardial infarction. So next we were interested to see if MSC exosomes also mediate anti-apoptotic effects in cardiomyocytes, or if they can even induce cardiomyocyte proliferation. And so on the left upper image, uh, we performed a tunnel assay. And as you can see there, with higher concentrations of MSC exosomes, we were actually able to inhibit apoptosis in neonatal cardiomyocytes by about 10%. When we tested if MSC exosomes were able to induce proliferation in cardiomyocytes, uh, we did not see any effects um, on the increasing of proliferation of cardiomyocytes. So no proliferative effects were observed. Now, the question is, what is responsible for the regenerative effects of exosomes? And because microRNAs make up an important component of exosomes, 
we were interested to see if the effects could be explained with the microRNA composition. And so we performed microRNA pro profiling with the nanostring technology. Um, what we did is we obtained reads of microRNA back and rank ordered them based on total read counts. And here we show the top 50 microRNAs. And what you can also see is that the top 23 microRNAs accounted for 80% of all of the exosomal microRNA content. And the remaining 128 microRNAs were present at very low reads and made up a very small percentage of the total reads, less than 0.7%. And so we deemed them unlikely to have significant biological effects compared to the more abundant top 23 microRNAs. And so they were excluded for further analysis. Um, more importantly, the average read count of the top 23 microRNAs were at least 23 times more abundant than the average read counts of the remaining MSC microRNAs. And so the next question was that with so many different microRNAs, what effects do we actually expect? It is known that one microRNA can target hundreds of mRNAs, and so it can have hundreds of mRNA targets. And this is due to the fact that you don't need 100% match-based pairing to observe microRNA effects. So microRNA can bind to mRNA just based on their seed site, as you can see in the panel B. They can bind in their central dominant region, shown in the panel C, or they can bind in the three prime compensatory region, shown in panel D. And so to predict the biological effects of the top 23 microRNAs um, combined, we use bioinformatic analysis. And so what we did is we used MURDOP to predict the genes that are targeted by these top 23 microRNAs, and a total of 5,500 genes were targeted. Then these gene target sets were further analyzed by PANTHER to identify statistically overrepresented pathways in biological processes. And so as you can see here on the left-hand side, on the left image, the majority of the genes substantially contributed to specific processes related to cardiovascular development, angiogenesis, and tube formation. There were some pathways related to cell death and growth, and then pathways related to fibrosis, such as wind signaling, PDGF, and TGF-beta. And the top microRNAs affecting the most targets with respect to circulatory system development and processes related to vasculature and tube development were microRNA 23A, 3P, microRNA 424, microRNA 144, and microRNA 130A. And to gain a better understanding of how the genes and biological processes regulated by the top 23 microRNAs relate to one another, um, we visualize a complex network with cytoscape. And so what you can see here is that the microRNAs that target similar gene clusters are in close proximity to one another. For example, microRNA199A3P and microRNA1455P target similar gene clusters versus um, microRNA29A and microRNA29B. Those target similar gene clusters as well, but those are different from the gene cluster clusters targeted by the microRNA199A and microRNA1455P. We then analyze um, the microRNA target genes with regard to the biological pathways. And again, what you can see here is that several of the pathways that we actually shown um, just now with in vitro um, experiments were predicted with our bioinformatics analysis. And these include angiogenesis, antigen signaling, but also TGF beta signaling and PDGF beta signaling, which is responsible for um, extracellular matrix deposition by increasing collagen and fibronectin and by modulating fibrosis. 
some other pathways were predicted. However, they were not statistically significant. For example, P53, an apoptotic pathway. Um, in our in vitro experiments, we were able to show that MSC exosomes do have some anti-apoptotic effect, but the effects were really weak. And so what we can say overall is that uh, we can actually confirm the biological effects with our bioinformatics analysis. So there was high statistical significance for pathways related to angiogenesis and fibrosis, such as PDGF and TGF-beta. The MSC exosomes promote angiogenesis and tube formation assay using HUVEX. And the MSC exosomes were able to reduce fibrosis in our collagen production assay using cardiac fibroblasts. There were other pathways that were predicted but not statistically significant, and this include the P53 pathway and biological processes related to growth dynamics of cardiovascular systems. So the next question we asked was, can we further improve the intrinsic regenerative effects of MSC exosomes by loading them with specific microRNAs. And from our network analysis, we identified microRNA 130A and microRNA 199 as potential candidates for mediating angiogenic and anti-apoptotic effects. So microRNA 130 is interesting because it targets 99 genes related to angiogenesis, and it was the only abundant microRNAs predicted to target HOXA5. This is a um, gene that inhibits angiogenesis. MicroRNA 199A has been shown to induce up to have proliferative effects on cardiomyocytes. And when we look at our in silico predictions, it also targeted genes related to cell death that were not targeted by any of the other top 23 microRNAs. So that's why we proceeded with microRNA 13A and 199A. And so what we did is we um, passively loaded microRNA 199A and microRNA 130A into MSC exosomes. So to do that, we electroplated the MSC cells with the different types of microRNAs, um, watched them to remove any unbound or unincorporated microRNAs, and then collected the exosomes. And um, we achieved higher loading of microRNAs into exosomes with an increasing concentrations of the microRNAs. We then went ahead and um, tested the efficacy or the effect of these microRNA 130A loaded exosomes um, on inducing angiogenesis in HUVEX. And what you can see here, MSC exosomes enriched with high doses of microRNA 130A. These are shown in the a right panel, um, left panel of the images increased all angiogenesis endpoints in a dose-dependent manner. So we were able to increase the total length. The, we were able to increase the total number of nodes, the total number of junctions, and we were also able to increase, to significantly increase the mesh index. And so the non-treated or unmodified exosomes um, did not score on the MESH index, indicating that a capillary-like network of tubular structures only emerged with specific enrichment with microRNA 130A. And so the MESH network is also very nicely visualized in the images on the right-hand side. So on the, the upper image, you can see HUVEX cells that were not treated, so you don't see any tube formation or any signs of meshes. However, in the bottom image, um, the HUVEX cells that were treated with microRNA 30A loaded exosomes showed a significant increase in the number of branches and in the number of meshes. And so the angiogenesis inducing effects of microRNA 130A have been shown to occur through the downregulation of HOXA5, and this is what we have verified here. Um, when we determined the expression level of HOXA5 expression HUVEX cells, only the HUVEX cells treated with the microRNA 
130 loaded exosomes showed downregulation of HOXA5. And that the downregulation is about 80%. Versus with unmodified exosomes, even at really, really high concentration, there was only a negligible effect on downregulation of HOXA5. We then selected microRNA-199A for further analysis because it has been shown to induce proliferation in cardiomyocytes, an endpoint which we were unable to achieve with just unmodified MSC exosomes. Further, microRNA-199A loaded exosomes significantly inhibited apoptosis as shown in the tunnel assay. This is shown in the right um, in the images on the left hand side. And the images on the right hand side, you can see that neonatal cardiomyocytes treated with exosomes loaded with microRNA 199A was actually able to increase cardiomyocyte proliferation, and this in a statistically significant manner. So, in order to understand the mechanism of action of MSC exosomes and microRNA, 199A loaded exosomes in preventing cardiomyocytes apoptosis. Cardiomyocytes were actually treated with hydrogen peroxide. This is shown in the bottom panel of the images. And so we then analyzed the expression levels of apoptotic markers such as P53, NSKPB, BAX, and caspase 9 in exosome treated and non treated cardiomyocytes. And treatment of apoptosis-induced cardiomyocytes with unmodified exosomes showed a trend towards BAX, um, P53, and an f kappa b reduction. The microRNA-199A3P loaded exosomes significantly decreased BAX expression and mediated further reductions of P53, and f kappa b and caspase 9 and so the increased potency of the microRNA-199A loaded exosome is likely due to its ability to lower the expression levels of multiple inducing apoptotic inducing genes as shown here, including caspase 9, which is an important initiator in the apoptosis signaling cascade. So we were then interested to see how the microRNA content of exosomes derived from other cells looked like in comparison to MSC, um, PC3, and HEC exosomes. And so again, we performed microRNA profiling with the nanostring technology. And what we did is we rank ordered the microRNAs based on total read counts. And so what you can see here is that generally speaking, the microRNA content of exosomes correlates pretty well with the microRNA composition of the parent cells. So we have um, the microRNA read of the HEC cells um, plotted against the microRNA read counts of the HEC exosomes. And then we did the same thing for the MSC cell microRNA read counts versus the cell um, MSC exosome microRNA read counts. And then last but not least, um, we did also a comparison for the microRNAs found in PC3 cells versus the microRNAs found in the PC exosomes. And as you can see, all of them show a very nice correlation um, with a few outliers. If you look um, into which specific microRNAs are actually enriched into exosomes of specific, uh, from, derived from specific types of cells, you can see um, that some microRNAs are selectively packaged into exosomes. And so each exosome has different, a unique microRNA profile. So the human embryonic kidney cells have a different, um, unique microRNA profile compared to the mesenchymal stem cell exosomes and compared to the prostate cancer exosomes. We were then interested to see how the microRNAs of different exosomes correlate with one another. And so as you can see here, the microRNAs between exosomes from different cells show really poor correlations. 
some of the microRNAs are more abundant in MSC exosomes compared to HEC exosomes. This is the first image, and vice versa. And so each exosome to seem to have their unique fingerprint. And this supports the overall belief that cells send out exosomes to modulate their microenvironment. And this is also in line with our hypothesis that it's very important to characterize exosomes before they are used as drug carriers. Because depending on the cellular sources, they can have a different microRNA composition. And this, in turn, can actually affect their biological function. So here's a different way of looking at the microRNA composition of exosomes. From the top 50 microRNAs, from prostate cancer cells, embryonic kidney cells, MSC exosomes, there are 21 microRNAs that the exosomes have in common. MSC exosomes have 17 unique microRNAs that are not present in HEC exosomes. The HEC exosomes, they have 15 unique microRNAs that are not present in PC3 exosomes or MSC exosomes. And again, PC3 exosomes have 11 unique microRNAs that cannot be found in MSC exosomes or HEC exosomes. And so as a summary, I can say that MSC exosomes have regenerative effects, and this can in part be in explained by their microRNA composition. And so we were able to predict the biological processes and pathways using bioinformatics analysis. We were also able to further improve on the intrinsic regenerative effects of MSC exosomes by loading them with specific microRNAs. And in this case, it was microRNA 130 and microRNA 199A. And so those microRNAs further increase the effects of the MSC exosomes on angiogenesis. They further significantly increase the anti apoptotic effects, and they also increase the effects on cardiomyocyte proliferation. And so in general, we can also say that exosomes derive from different cells display unique microRNA compositions, and this has very important implications for their biological function, their side effects when used for treating specific diseases, but also for therapeutic applications. And so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, most of the work was done by Scott Ferguson, Jin Li Wang, and Christine Lee, and I would like to thank the NIH and the NSF for funding, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, you have shown that exosomes derived from different cellular sources show distinct biological activities. Based on that, which exosomes should be used as drug carriers and for what applications? Um, thank you, Alexis. Um, I think this is a very important question. Um, our data indicate that more attention needs to be paid to the exosomes chosen as drug carriers. And so it's really important that they are characterized prior to use. Um, clearly, as we have shown here, MSC exosomes are ideal for tissue regeneration, also for regeneration of fibrotic and ischemic tissues. Um, however, there are a lot of phenotypic effects um, that could be negative in one application, but may be beneficial in another. And so in our recently published paper, where we also did microRNA profiling using the nanostring platform, we show that PC3 and HEC exosomes both show effects that could potentially promote adverse clinical effects under certain conditions. So they could promote tumor growth through undesired macrophage polarization or pro by promoting cellular invasion. And this is it was a little bit surprising to see because HEC exosomes is a widely used cellular source for exosomes. And 
um, and also used as um, drug carriers. So um, I think we really need to pay attention to the intrinsic biological effects of exosomes in general. And it looks like we have time for one more question. As you mentioned, exosomes contain various components, including different types of lipids. Are exosomal lipids inert, or do they also exert biological activity? Yes, so um, in this study, we have mainly focused on the microRNA composition of exosomes, but um, we know that exosomes also consist of other components, and one of those components are lipids. And so there are a lot of studies um, or results that now indicate that lipids not only serve as biovesicles, but are also biologically active. Um, for example, ceramides, which are present at low concentrations in exosomes, they can actually have pro-apoptotic effects. And so ceramide enriched exosomes have been shown to induce astrocyte apoptosis. And so this could potentially contribute to the progression of Alzheimer's diseases. And there are other types of lipids that are um, present in exosomes that actually can affect, um, play a role in the progression of other diseases. And so these studies strongly suggest that the effects of exosomes are not only mediated by the protein and nucleic acid content, but also that the exosomal lipids can significantly modulate their bioactivity. I would like to once, once again thank Dr. Nguyen for her presentation. I would also like to thank Nanostring Technologies for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August of 2018. You will receive an email from Labrits letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.